Hey YouTube, Joe Boy here. So, this is without question one of the weirdest times to be a fan of One Piece. And that's mainly because we don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, like, you know this from a chapter by chapter basis, different things could happen. But generally, you have a good idea about the, the trajectory of the story going forward. But right now, not really. I'm not gonna lie, Green Bull's appearance has me stumped for a variety of reasons which we're gonna discuss in the video and eventually we're gonna come to a conclusion but at the same time I want to acknowledge that this is very weird. Yeah, I want you to know that. So we've talked at great length about One Piece essentially repeating itself. It's one of the first things that I talked about on my channel. Uh, essentially the post time skip is a lot of inversions of the pre time skip. Oda takes similar ideas and tries to do them in opposite ways that are similar or twist things, escalate things, or allude to them. This discussion is a whole can of worms if you aren't familiar, but some, some of the big ideas, right, that are commonly thrown around is that Alabas and Dressrosa are very similar, but placed in different timelines of a warlord taking over a country. Fishman Island directly relates to Arlong Park. But instead of Fishman racism against humans, it's humans racism against Fishman. I really do not want to get deep into it, but this is so common that you could probably realistically make like a 10 hour video comparing the pre and post time skip in various concepts that Oda has used, reused, and inverted. And I think that it's going to be, and it already is the same for Green Bull. Green Bull shows up at the conclusion of an arc after the Strats have defeated the villain that they have prepared and, and efforted so hard against. This should remind you of Garp and Aokiji at the conclusion of Eni's Lobby, but the more direct comparison, the one that I resonate with more, is Kuma at the conclusion of Thriller Park. The main similarity between all three of these examples of enemies at the conclusion of the arc is that really they were all friendly with the strats from Garp, grandfather of Luffy. Yes, he was supposed to attack Luffy, but how much was his heart in it, right? It wasn't taken all that seriously. Aokiji, instead of, of trying to capture Robin, seems to want to see where she'll go, see what she'll do. And then the same with Kuma. Kuma had orders from the world government to capture the Straw Hats, but his secret allegiance was to the Revolutionary Army and Dragon, Luffy's father. These are typically how I would expect the story or stories in general to go. We just had a big arc uh, with payoff, a feeling of completeness. It wouldn't make too much sense to have a full blown battle immediately after without story in between. But at the same time, we have to keep in mind this concept of inversion. Oda's always looking to tell One Piece in the same way, but in a targeted, different way, which creates a totally different experience. We talked about one of these recently with Sanji, his leaving the crew in Whole Cake Island and Zo, how it's a combination of pretty much every strat who left the crew up until that point in time for whatever reason. You can talk about Nami, Robin, or Usopp. Within Sanji's character arc, you have elements of all of them. And so what does Oda immediately do? From pretty much the moment that Green Bull arrives, he clarifies where Green Bull stands or who Green Bull is aligned with. And it is a Kainu, which does not bode well. Now, some of you might say, well, Garp and Aokiji and Kuma were all aligned with the world government and the Marines in some way, so this is no different. But it is very different because it's not necessarily who you work for, but who you look up to. All three of those characters are diametrically opposed to Akainu. Akainu represents thorough justice, and we see this evidence throughout the story. It doesn't matter his personal connections or feelings. It doesn't matter how much good a bad person might have done, or how much good a, a bad person could do in the future. Akainu will eliminate them. And as Green Bull says in the chapter itself, he loves Akainu's cut no corners attitude, so it should be the same. Or at least very, very close. So there's theories floating around, and these may end up being true, that Green Bull has some reason to applaud or uh, to be thankful for the strats. For instance, theories that Green Bull is from Wano. I don't know if these theories are true or not, but I want to address them just in the fact that if he looks up to Akainu and he resonates with Akainu's ideology at all, it really shouldn't matter. 
So I feel like from this alone, we already have our first inversion of the pre time skip and the post time skip. Every threat that appeared at the conclusion of the arc ended up being friendly or was mitigated because of relationships. I really doubt that that will be the case with Green Bull, even if he has reason to. In fact, I kind of want him to have reason to. I think that is the most uh, satisfying comparison that Oda can make to give Green Bull all the reasons or some of the reasons that uh, uh, Aokiji or Kuma or Garp had to not give it their all in the fight, to have those same reasons, but still give it his all with the intention to capture and kill. But so here's the idea of the video that we're going to pursue. We're gonna treat Green Bull as if he's Sanji. Oda parallels things in different ways, and Sanji is not the only example of how he does this, sort of combining everything related to it from the pre-time skip into its own thing. But I like this train of thought. I like combining Garp, Aokiji, and Kuma into one character, using elements of all of them and, and injecting it into Green Bull's story to see what kind of differences it creates, or in what ways it could be the same. So in order to analyze this, we have to analyze all of those three other characters. And I suppose we'll begin with Garp, because I feel like Garp is the most simple and probably the least interesting. Garp's story in the post-arc of Annie's Lobby mainly related to Luffy's lineage. Garp arrived to info dump that Luffy is the son of Dragon, the most wanted man, and also the grandson of the hero of the Marines, the guy who eschewed becoming an admiral, Garp himself. There are already theories that Aramaki Green Bull could be related to Zoro. I don't believe these entirely. I wanna make that clear. There's, I mean, will it happen or won't it happen? I'm investing nothing, but it is an idea that people have thrown out there. I know that Ohara specifically has made a, a video where he's overlapped Aramaki's face with Shimotsuke Ushimaru, who currently it's speculated might be Zoro's father or more likely in my opinion, Zoro's grandfather. The only real difference is Green Bull has different lips, I would say. And at first glance, the resemblance is not the most obvious. But as I've said, Ohara has overlapped the face and there are definitely similarities. Ushimaru, Ushi means bull, green bull. We know that Zoro has green hair, green bull. Coincidence or not? The moment that Green Bull is introduced in Wano, we get a panel from Yamato explaining how it's customary in Wano culture to fast for your dream or your wish. And Green Bull has been fasting. Are these things related or not? This was also pointed out to me, and this could be a thing that Oda tends to overlook, it may not be important, but it really does appear as if Green Bull knows his way around Wano. He immediately finds Queen and King in the Udon prison. Does he have history in Wano? The other thing that I find to be very conspicuous is I expect some reveals about Zoro's lineage regardless. I've said this in multiple videos recently. You cannot, cannot, until it is debunked, cannot convince me that Zoro is not a Shimotsuke by blood. He was raised in Shimotsuke village in the East Blue. We already know that he has a connection with Ryuma and looks strikingly similar to Ryuma from the one shot that Oda drew so long ago. And he looks strikingly similar as Ushimaru as well. I also find it very likely that there was some sort of mass exodus from Wano around the time that Orochi and Kaido assumed control. It would be surprising to me if this did not happen. A narrative that I could get behind is all the samurai fathers sending their children and their wives somewhere else. This could include a young Aramaki. We don't currently know his age, but I would guess, I think a reasonable guess, is about 45 years old. Which would mean the, the Orochi era of, of Wano, he would have been in his teens. So if he was forced to leave Wano or decided to leave Wano, he could have learned about the Shimosuke village in the East Blue, thus had the potential of birthing a child there, or leaving a child there in Zoro. And it's not as if the idea of Aramaki having a child is, is really absurd because he has kanji written on him directly, which alludes to essentially star-crossed lovers. Double suicide at Death River. I think that it is guaranteed that Green Bull's story, his history is going to involve love. And if it involves love, 
it could involve a child. So to bring this back to Garp as one of the threats at the conclusion of Annie's Lobby, the big component of his story was revealing his relation to Luffy, basically hyping Luffy up. And this would be exactly the same for Zoro. You could see that, well, Luffy has an admiral, essentially, in his bloodline, and so too does Zoro. But there's also room for inversions, as I see it. The big thing with Garp, and this was later clarified in Marineford, is that despite his loyalty to the Marines, which is also kind of questionable, but despite his his desire to uphold the ideals of the Marines and follow orders, there are times that he simply can, and it often involves his family. But will Aramaki, will Green Bull be the same if he truly is related to the country of Wano or to the Straw Hats? How does he align these priorities? If he's anything like a Kainu, as I said, it won't matter. But just to rapid fire some other things that were present in Garp's story that may be related in some way with Green Bull and Wano right now, Kobe uh, played a role, he made an appearance, it's possible that he can do so again. Drake has obviously been stationed under Kaido for a reason, he is a member of S.W.O.R.D., Kobe is also a member of S.W.O.R.D., they're going to be interested in the secrets that Wano holds, so this was a realistic thing that could happen. Another thing that was brought up was Seastone. And we, I kind of expect some exposition about Wano and Seastone. But the reason that Seastone was mentioned was to introduce Vegapunk, really, his inventions, um, coating the bottom of Navy ships in Seastone to help protect against the, the Sea Kings over the Combell. We expect Vegapunk soon as well. If you recall, Orochi's last demand of CP0 was his weapons in exchange for Vegapunk. We don't know if this is actually going to amount to anything, but it could. It could be that CP0 essentially agreed to Orochi's demands and sent Vegapunk so that he could appear now. There's actually one more comparison that I want to make between what could be with Green Bull and with Garp's story. However, I think that it'll be easier to talk about this once we talk about Kuma. The first two things which come to mind when talking about Kuma as the post-arc threat is one, he's the only one who actually inflicted any damage and, and seriously provided tension for an extended period of time. And the other element is I always viewed it as a test, and I feel like that's the best way to package the idea as something that maybe Oda could use again. And actually a third thing that we're just going to mention and then probably not mention again, but it, the big thing with Kuma was the nothing happened moment for Zoro. I mean, we got a setup of something related to that in Wano. I'm not sure if it went anywhere that I'm satisfied with, but maybe it does now. So in what order do I want to talk about this? Because it can really go in any direction. I guess we'll just start here. If you guys remember, Kuma appeared pretty much at the exact moment that Moria was defeated. And as Moria was defeated, Luffy went unconscious, everyone got their shadows back, so the majority of the fighting force was still accumulated, although still badly damaged from the prior battle. Kuma then proceeded to pretty much flex on everybody. One by one, he starts taking people out, from inconsequential to someone like Frankie, and finally he uses his powers, compresses air, and pretty much creates a giant explosion, from which the only two people who emerged were Sanji and Zoro. But I want to clarify this. Kuma held back tremendously, and it appears to me made sure not to kill anyone. I feel like we should phrase it like this for the rest of the video. What would a Kainu do, right? Because Green Bull looks up to a Kainu, we should presume that his actions should be similar. If he really wants to impress a Kainu, you would think that one, he would know how to do that, and two, it would end up looking a lot like a Kainu. So in the same situation, a Kainu is there or not, Kuma, everyone dies. At the same time, we should probably assume that there is a key difference between Green Bull and a Kainu because they are not the same character. What this manifests as, your guess is as good as mine. But I'm going to, to wager here that uh, an inversion between how Kuma showed up and how Green Bull's gonna show up is that innocent civilians' lives are definitely going to be at stake this time. But this leads us into Kuma's test because he basically made a deal with Zoro that he would take Zoro's life instead of Luffy's. But he first clarifies that he's here, he would be satisfied, the world government would be satisfied, he could spare everyone if he simply gets Luffy. This is something we haven't talked about Aokiji yet, it's shared with Luffy's fight 
in Aokiji, there's this concept of honor that once an agreement is made, a duel, duels almost treated like a sacred thing. Aokiji and Kuma both honored the terms of the duel. Aokiji promised to fight Luffy and just Luffy and spare the crew. Kuma promised to inflict pain onto Zoro and just Zoro, which would likely kill him and spare the crew. For me, I feel extremely confident that this scenario is going to arise again. I think that Green Bull is going to come in guns blazing. I think that he may end up attacking a lot of people. Uh, and I think that the go-to in the story in any situation like this is to basically force him to choose an opponent and spare the rest. I think that it's likely that Luffy and or the other Straw Hats are going to make this demand in some way. Luffy will say, hey, you came here for me. We will fight it out. If you manage to defeat me, you can take me. But leave everyone else out of it. So the question that we should be asking is how honorable is Green Bull? Does he agree with these terms? Or is he willing to take hostages? Again, what would Akainu do? It is very unlikely that Akainu would be honorable in a situation like this. I feel like that was one of the, the big lessons at the conclusion of Marineford after Ace and Whitebeard had been killed and there was really no reason to fight. The only person who rejected this notion of letting the, the pirates run away was Akainu. It doesn't matter if you got what you were looking for or what you, you wanted. Kainu wants more thoroughness. And any means is on the table. That again does not bode well. But I do think something like this occurring would be fitting within Wano and relate directly to Odin and really establish who Luffy is and the kinds of people who Luffy might hate most. Why did Odin never defeat Orochi? Why, you know, it's even stated by Kaido uh, by the time of their battle that Odin, when he first arrived to Wano, could have defeated him, but he didn't. And the reason he didn't was because of hostages. Odin pretty much sacrificed everything, his perception, his pride, to protect the lives of the innocent. I think that this is already and will end up being one of the major backbone themes of the story and, and tie in with the conclusion. There's always a better way. The Strats will never stoop to the level of their opponent in order to win. I think that it is established quite clearly that one of the worst things that you can do is to live your life with regrets. This is why characters smile before they die, is they lived a, a full life, a good life, a life that they can be proud of. They both did what they wanted and what they could as best as they could. Victory is only sweet the right way, and failure at the end is accepted in part because your dreams will be inherited. If Luffy gets captured, there's a possibility that they can fight sometime later, but if somebody starts killing innocent lives and Luffy doesn't want that, you don't get a second try. I'm sure that there's a lot of people, even people that are watching this video and huge fans of One Piece, who, whether they know it or not, very much disagree with this philosophy. It's about victory, no matter the cost, because it's the greater good. Um, I think One Piece teaches something that is very divergent from this concept. It's about living your personal best life, never breaking your moral code. By living the right way, you influence the future in a positive way. So victory in the here and now is not necessary. I kind of like to think about it as, as pragmatism versus spirituality. One Piece teaches spirituality. But it's not important whether you agree or disagree with the concept, it's obviously a story, so it operates based on its own rules. And so this is why Odin did what he did. This is why he danced and made a fool out of himself for years as he was constantly searching for the better way. He knew that if he fought Kaido and he fought Orochi, that Orochi would use those lives against him and he didn't want that on his conscience. It wasn't until he was absolutely sure that it didn't matter anyway that the battle became something that was the right thing. But quite frankly, this is a situation that Luffy hasn't really been put in before, where you have somebody so absurdly powerful and a mass of civilians and that person specifically targeting them to make Luffy lay down his arms. And if this situation were to arise, I think that Luffy would. But before we get there, we have this idea of a test. Kuma was testing the strats. You, this is confirmed at the conclusion where he remarks that Luffy really does have a crew that is awesome and capable. 
When Kuma shared Luffy's pain with Zoro, it had a lot of symbolic meaning. Um, and judging based on the few lines of dialogue that Green Bull had in this chapter as he's talking to both Queen and King, I actually think that the one being tested here is going to be Green Bull himself. This is how I see this being inverted. But here's what Aramaki says as he is stomping on Queen's face. I warned you not to test me, didn't I? A guy in my position can't go around getting beat by pirate subordinates. The Navy doesn't have any spare manpower to spend or to send around performing cleanup. I think that this gives me the impression that Aramaki has something to prove. Like, hey, I'm an admiral. I can't be spending time messing around with, with pirate subordinates. And I think that we should keep in mind that he is a new admiral. He was selected by some unusual means. And as for now, I don't know if he has a lot of feats to his name. So yes, I think that he has something to prove. So how I interpret this is, is obviously we're getting deeper into headcanon here, but I think that he shows up guns blazing, maybe attacking innocent people. He's challenged to a duel by Luffy and he accepts because the person being tested is himself. Or can we interrelate this with Zoro? He's talking about, I can't waste time on Yonko commanders. Well, that could also set up a potential Zoro and Green Bull duel. With everything stated, this makes a lot of sense as well. Now, if he ends up losing to Luffy or a defeat is in, in any way in question, does he hold to his honor? That's still a question. And this leads us back to Aokiji. I thought I was going to have an entire section labeled Aokiji, but I, th I think not just because it's all interrelated uh, too closely. But there isn't many instances in the story where Luffy is just straight up embarrassed. But his fight with Aokiji is one instance of this. A possible inversion here, though, is that this embarrassment took place in private. And the only ones who know or knew about it was the Strat crew themselves. But this, I mean, Luffy is now the hero of this country. He defeated Kaido. This is a big stage. And when she's not fighting to prove himself, he's fighting to hold his ground. Already, by the premise of this, I'm intrigued because it's different. And there's still a lot at stake here because, and this is why the situation is, is so weird, or one of the reasons why, is because the strats can't simply leave. I mean, now that you're a Yonko, right, you have to defend your territory. That's what it means to be a Yonko. So if Wano is now under the Strat banner, so far in the story, Luffy has yet to, uh, hasn't been forced to actively stop other people from trying to take it from him. But the world government is trying to do that right now. Again, by the premise alone, it's it's captivating. The, the simple idea of it. It's like, yeah, this is where the story should go, logically. You're a Yonko now. The Marines were scared to fight against Yonko for a reason. Luffy, now you have to embody this same sort of mystique and back it up with action. But without question, it would be tough to do while maintaining your moral compass. If we're a guy like Roger, for instance, Roger uh, was known to defend his friends uh, fiercely. But we're not led to believe that he picked up any territory along his adventures. Like the idea that I have is, as you have all these pirates in the new world trying to stake their claim and, and carve out territory and Roger's just kind of laughing as he goes between them looking for stuff to do. So by trying to protect islands, and Luffy has definitely tried to do that. He set his flag in Fishman Island. I think the same is going to be true with Wano and Dressrosa. He's trying to do more than Roger. And with that becomes, it becomes tough. Oda may or may not go in this direction, but I kind of see this as a potential crowning moment for Luffy as a, a Yonko, right? Now that you actually have territory that you are supposed to defend, people who are counting on you, you have to actually do it. If he does it, then... I think that he's officially here. He is without question a Yonko. If he doesn't do it, you know, other interesting things will happen. But my overall feeling is is probably that the results of this confrontation with Green Bull are not going to go disastrously bad for the Straw Hats and for Luffy. That's a, that's a gut feeling. And the main thing that I have in my mind, which might act to save Luffy, regardless of whether he's stronger than Green Bull or not, we're not gonna really discuss that. I'm excited to see their interactions, their fight. But I think overall, it doesn't matter who's stronger because Green Bull should win because if he's a Kainu-like, he will be able to do anything. Things that Luffy is not going to be able to fight against. So Luffy essentially needs something to save him. So a link between Garp and Kuma in the pre-timeskip as threats at the end of the arc. Uh, a link between them is the Revolutionary Army. First off, Garp shows up and 
reveals that Luffy is the son of Dragon the Revolutionary. I would classify this as a combination of, of lineage and revolutionary army, if I was to package it. And then in the next arc in Thriller Bark, when we have our enemy appear, we find out that he is an actual member, or was actually a member of the Revolutionary Army. And that is the main reason above all else that he spares the Straw Hats. But actually, if you want to stretch it, there's also a link to the Revolutionary Army with Aokiji. It wasn't present in the moment that we met Aokiji, right? But Aokiji was interested not in the rest of the Straw Hats, he was interested in Robin. Robin, who eventually was sent to and for period of the time skip joined with the Revolutionary Army. I really hope that some of you picked up on this ahead of time as a, a probable discussion point when talking about how things might be inverted. Aokiji was interested in nobody but Robin. Then we have Kuma. Kuma was tasked with taking out the strats, but then decided I could take Luffy and the world government would be satisfied by that. Then I guess you could say that he was distracted by Zoro. His attention turned to Zoro instead. I think that you can see at least how Green Bull could be all of these things wrapped into one. He's coming here to take out the Strats as a whole. Meanwhile, in the chapter itself where we see him, he's holding Luffy's bounty poster. He cannot wait to give Akainu Luffy's head. We've discussed how Zoro might be his son. That's a pretty easy way of being distracted by Zoro. At the same time, the threat of Nico Robin has been a hyped up thing throughout this arc. and. I think needs to come up at least once before we leave. And this is another, I think, very important thing. Green Bull seems to look up to Akainu. He wants to impress Akainu. Way it's phrased by other people, he wants Akainu's attaboy, right? Who are the two Straw Hats above all others that Akainu would be interested in? Luffy and Robin. These two Straw Hats have his attention because Akainu was the one to actually kill off the majority of Ohara. We know that. Akainu is thorough justice. He wants to do it all the way, right? So this hasn't been a thing that's highlighted in the story, but I think that you can imagine that Robin's continued existence is going to be a sore spot for Akainu, a job left undone. Getting Nico Robin should assuredly lead to an attaboy for Green Bull. And of course, at the same time, you have Luffy in the events in Marineford, son of Dragon, right? Akainu has it out for Luffy as well. So let's cut to the chase and get a little crazy. We've actually talked about this at the beginning of the arc and a little bit in the middle as well, but there's a connection between the Revolutionary Army and the country of Wano. Uh, we know that the Revolutionary Army is tracking weapons sold in the underworld that has been distributed to countries that are within their purview, that uh, essentially the, the world government has incited civil war in countries that the Revolutionary Army has liberated. But they've done this on the low key. They've done this in or through illegal channels. And the Revolutionary Army are tracking them down. We see this in Dressrosa. We see this with Sabo and Koala. They're on the hunt for where the weapons that the world government is distributing, where are they produced? And this country, we find out, is actually Wano. They're Kaido's weapons. Initially purchased by Doflamingo and then distributed elsewhere. Once Doflamingo went down, we see the CP0 is directly negotiating with Orochi and Kaido. So long story short, I believe since before this arc even began, pretty much, that the Revolutionary Army needs the final piece of their puzzle and it's going to serve a purpose for them. But if the Revolutionary Army is uh, actually going to do this, they had best hurry. I mean, they need to get here now for a number of reasons. Let's say the Strats leave and don't save Wano. So the Marines and Green Bull just basically capture the place and turn it into, you know, a uh, territory of the world government. What happens to those factories under those circumstances? Of course, the Celestial Dragons are going to cover up any and all evidence. I don't think this is going to happen, but I'm just saying that if, if Green Bull wins and the Strats are forced to leave, right, the Revolutionary Army are not going to reach their end goal. What if the Straw Hats win? What if they dispel Green Bull and then Wano remains a protected place? Outside of world government's influence, what happens to the factories then? Well, Momo tells us that no factories are going to be allowed to poison the land. They're basically going to destroy the factories. Again, the evidence that the, the Revolutionary Army needs is going to be destroyed. So it is my opinion that the Revolutionary Army shows up now, following the trail that Oda has clearly laid out. 
We've discussed scenarios in which the situation could get really sticky. I think that ultimately, if it does go like this, the thing that will save them is likely going to be the appearance of the Revolutionary Army. But there's some more connections here. Part of Kuma's story is that he was secretly aligned with another force. We know from an SBS, Oda has revealed that both Fujitora and Green Bull uh, have their own agendas. If you want context here, there was a question in SBS Volume 76 where somebody asked Oda, could the two new admirals, Ryokugu and Fujitora, possibly have been created with the concept that, despite them being people of the Marines, deep down inside they are both admirals who secretly harbor ill feelings towards the world government? And Oda's answer was essentially, what, me, uh, become restless, cold sweat, well, what, what are you talking about? Of course not. It's about as much of a confirmation as we're ever going to receive that what the person posed in the question is true, that for one reason or another, Green Bull does have interests that do not align with the world government. And I just want to make sure that you understand this. It's not out of the question then that, that Green Bull can look up to Akainu, but also not be totally aligned with the world government. Because I don't think that Akainu is totally aligned with the world government. All this shady stuff that these Celestial Dragons and Cypherpaul have been getting up to are going to be things that infuriate Akainu as much as anyone else. For Akainu, I've always liked to define him as an ally of the Marines, uh, not necessarily the world government. And so this leads us into another fact. We know that Shimotsuke Village, the one that Zoro was raised in, is related to and has a connection to the Revolutionary Army. We see at the conclusion of the Ace Luffy Sabo flashback, the Revolutionary Army docks in Shimosuke Village for a period of recuperation. Uh, and then the dojo assists them with provisions and supplies. This becomes very, very curious if uh, Zoro is actually Aramaki's son. He dropped him off in Shimosuke Village or perhaps after he left Wano just lived there for a time. The theory is, is that just as Kuma was a member of the Revolutionary Army who was tasked with taking down the Strats, Aramaki also has a connection to the Revolutionary Army. But I think, along with the premise of this theory, it's going to be twisted in some way. So rather than being a current member of the Revolutionary Army, Green Bull is our first former member. And at the very least, this would make the drama real spicy for when Fujitora and Green Bull uh, attacked Sabo at the referee. And it would make it real spicy if the Revolutionary Army showed up now with Green Bull being present. But again here, I do think that this would be a fitting time to reveal such a connection. If we're gonna, I think anyway, we're going to get some exposition about Zoro's past history, who he's related to, right, the country of Wano. So along these same lines, right, when we had Luffy, Luffy wasn't just the grandson of Garp, he was also the son of Dragon. Those two things were revealed at the same time. So you can reveal that Zoro is by, by blood from Wano, potentially royalty from Wano, but also you clarify Koshiro's connection with the Revolutionary Army as well, and the country of Wano's association with the Revolutionary Army. If everything that I said here is true, this is a combination of hype and drama that would make the end of this arc, the post-arc of, of Wano, incredible, for sure. You would also then learn about Robin's relationship with the Revolution Army. The moment that they appear, someone like Dragon maybe, appears for the first time. This isn't as much of an inversion as it is an escalation, which is another way in which Oda parallels the pre and post time skip. It's not just about turning things on its head, but it's about taking it to the next level. And in his lobby, it's revealed that Dragon is Luffy's father, but we don't actually get to meet him with this connection established. So then we have another post arc threat here with Green Bull, and this is the first time that Dragon actually meets Luffy, while it is known that he is Luffy's father. Luffy then can also learn what happened to Vivi and Sabo during the reverie, another thing that I find to be very fitting. Things start to tie together. I know that throughout this video a lot of people are going to say, oh there's not enough story left for all of this JB, but I think that this is actually a very concise way to bring big elements of the story together, both in a satisfying way but also in a quick way. And then as Nico Robin is concerned, I think that the Strats are able to defend her. I think that at some point maybe Green Bull might try to capture her, but the Strats will succeed. And at this point, Oda will try and convince us that the threat to Nico Robin is probably over because Luffy is a Yonko now. He's made it. He can defend his friends. But I don't think that the threat to Nico Robin is actually going to be over. But I do think that it'll be forgotten for a while. But anyway, I hope that this video was understandable. It's difficult to talk about the parallels pre and post time skip when you actually know 
or what's happened rather than speculate what could happen. And I'm not saying that everything in this video will happen, but I think that knowing that this concept is, is real and used constantly, like I said, a 10 hour video, you can reasonably make one when discussing things that we actually know. So I do wonder what Oda will use or won't use. And I definitely think that it is uh, possible that he could use it all. And the other thing which really triggers me is just how weird this whole situation is. There's certain things that I, feelings that I want to be left with. One of which is Green Bull just showed up. I don't want him to be decked and embarrassed immediately. I want to live in this moment of hype for Green Bull. So I hope that Green Bull gets some wins from this fight. At the same time, it doesn't make too much sense for him to straight up win and then capture Luffy. So a way to salvage both of these things is for Green Bull to come off as intimidating as a future antagonist, but then have someone like the Revolutionary Army show up, forcing Green Bull to retreat. Green Bull might look up to Akainu. Well, the same thing happened to Akainu in Marineford, and the person that played this role was Shanks. I think that no hype is lost if the Revolutionary Army shows up, and that's the reason why Green Bull says, uh, maybe later. I want you to think about Kobe. I want you to think about Vegapunk. I want you to think about the Revolutionary Army. I want you to think about the concept of a test, either for Luffy as a Yonko or for Green Bull as the new Admiral. Robin should become more important as well. Something I didn't mention is in Kuma's fight, it was revealed that he's a government weapon and he is a cyborg, which could have some relation to Pluton. I want you to think about lineage and the possibility of casualties or hostages. I believe that is the majority of what we discussed today in about 20 seconds. But yeah, guys, as always, I'm curious as to what you guys think. Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. Remember to subscribe and click the bell uh, and give a thumbs up to this video, man. Just show me that you like this. It was really depressing that we made a, a video about Frankie that I thought was really good. Most people that actually watched it thought the theory was really good, but people just don't seem that interested in clicking on it. Show Frankie some love. Link in the description and pinned in the comments. But yeah, of course, as always, have a wonderful day.